I am still quelling. the very first second gentleman, and he's Jewish. Doug Emhoff's rabbi must be so proud. I hope we are all proud that in a country where at one time his marriage to Kamala Harris would have been against the law, and in some states it was as recently as 1967, we now celebrate his family. I know that my family celebrates the Harris Emma family. Theirs, like mine, is a transracial family. An increasing number of Jewish families look like the second gentleman's. I love saying that, don't you? An increasing number of Jewish families look like the second gentleman's family and mine. As our Jewish community becomes more diverse, it seems only logical that Black History Month might make its way into the Jewish calendar. There is a synagogue in Miami that has offered services in Spanish and Hebrew because they have so many Spanish speaking congregants. A congregation in Los Angeles observes a Chinese New Year because they have so many members of Chinese origin. And many congregations, ours included, celebrate Pride Shabbat but we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Shabbat, you might ask, and we do. Such services have become staples of many congregations, complete with a black choir and a guest preacher. For many a Reformed synagogue, it is one of the most well-attended services of the year, and it should be. It is often an opportunity to reflect on the historic relationship between black and Jewish communities. We celebrate our common stories, and our commitment to social justice. We love the photographs of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel marching alongside Reverend King. MLK Shabbat, as we call it, celebrates the two distinct communities, not Jews who are also people of color. Yet we have often expected MLK Shabbat to do both. We love to trot out our members of color to participate in that service. Trust me, if my family and I are at a synagogue for MLK Shabbat, we will be lighting the candles. Increasingly, many people define themselves by more than just one identifier. We are certainly familiar with that idea. Whether we are American Jews or Jewish Americans, we are used to proudly wearing more than one identity. As our Jewish community has grown more diverse, we have acknowledged that through celebrations, learning, and Shabbat observances. We here at Temple Emmanuel have been doing much of that. A number of us have been watching films about civil rights, the role of the Jewish community in that struggle, and one about a young woman of color on her journey to the rabbinate. We have been reading books and hearing from our fellow members. From the conversations taking place, both in the larger Jewish community and here at Temple Emmanuel, we know that being both black and Jewish is not always so easy. And celebrating that intersectionality will take some thought and reflection. We may start with learning about the experiences of people of color, especially Jews of color when they enter Jewish spaces. Of course, I know that we would try to make anyone welcome who entered our doors or these days, I suppose, our Zoom rooms. But often when people of color enter Jewish spaces, it is just assumed they are not Jewish. Attempts to make those of color feel welcome may wind up doing just the opposite. Assuming that those of color are not Jewish risks making them feel like imposters or not welcome when they so want to feel at home. Instead of asking someone if they are familiar with the prayer book with best intentions, People of color are often at the receiving end of a tutorial in Jewish practice and worship, when in fact, they may be a longtime member of a synagogue quite familiar with the Siddur. In our attempts to be friendly, we may find ourselves making assumptions about people. We might assume that someone has converted to Judaism, not considering that they may have been Jewish all their lives, or assume that they are Jewish because of a connection to someone who is white. 
what to us may be an attempted conversation, might make someone feel that they are being asked to prove their Jewish credentials because of the color of their skin. Sometimes those things which serve to make us feel safe might make others uneasy. The presence of police cars and off-duty officers is something we have become accustomed to as part of congregational life. Given acts of anti-Semitism, the, these have offered us a measure of comfort and safety. Sadly, not all people of color see the presence of police and feel protected. They may worry that the officers expecting everyone coming to a synagogue to be light-skinned will question them or ask to see a form of identification. Imagine how humiliating and maybe even frightening that would be for someone coming to services. A friend of mine was the vice president of her synagogue. One year, she accompanied her members of her congregation to a URJ biennial. Her attendance coincided with a new campaign by the URJ to increase our welcome of Jews and people of color into our communities. As one of the few African-American people there, the staff photographers soon had her face up on the jumbotrons. My friend was celebrated wherever she went. When she returned, her home congregation hosted an event for their local federation. More than one guest at that event handed my friend their empty plate, assuming that rather than a leader of the congregation, she was there to clean up. I have often wondered how my children's black and Jewish identities might mesh. When they became B'nai Mitzvah, we had tali tote, including this one made from African fabrics for our family. We lit candles not only for Hanukkah, but for Kwanzaa too. But there were other ways that these two identities did not mesh. In middle school, my older son Avi went on a temple youth group event. It was a treasure hunt at the local mall. You can imagine a bunch of young teens running around the mall looking for clues in stores all over the place. Like most middle school boys, Avi always wore a hooded sweatshirt. That was when we had to have the talk with Avi. The talk as it is known is the discussion parents have with their black children. It is when we explain to them they must behave in certain ways and they will not be given the benefit of the doubt. It is when we tell our black children that when they go into a store, they cannot have their hands in their pockets to keep their jackets open and their hoods down off their heads. Even if their white friends don't have to do this, our children must. It is when we tell them that if they are accused of something to remain calm that if they are stopped by an officer of the law, be polite and never run away. Because people make assumptions. They may not see beyond the color of Avi's skin or his hoodie. They may not see a nice Jewish boy, the son of a rabbi and a school principal on a Jewish youth group event. They may not have noticed that he was actually with a group of teens because his skin color was not the same as theirs. So where do we begin as a Jewish community to think about celebrating Black History Month? I think we begin by listening. This is not always easy and the point is not to make people feel bad. It is so that we can begin to understand the lived experiences of others. To begin to understand that our experiences may differ, radically so. The funny thing is just how much we are learning about race these days. To date, over 37 million, 37 million DNA kits have been sold by companies such as Ancestry.com and 23andMe. Some people are getting results that surprise them. In an op-ed article by Libby Copeland, author of The Lost Family, How DNA Testing is Upending Who We Are, she writes, perhaps they or a parent was adopted or donor conceived and never told, or their families hid their genetic ancestries as an escape from discrimination. Maybe dad isn't their dad, genetically speaking, 
or they have a sister they never knew about. Some people are discovering their ancestors were black or Jewish. Others are learning their African-American lineages contain more European ancestry than they thought. According to a study by 23andMe, almost 4% of their customers who identified as white had at least 1% African ancestry. In Southern states, it increases to 12% of whites who have at least 1% African ancestry. Now, 1% may not seem like much, but at times it could make all the difference and determine whether one was black or white. Henry Louis Gates Jr., the Harvard professor, has estimated that there are millions of Americans who think they are white, but who in his words, according to the old notorious one drop rule of the Jim Crow era, would have been considered legally black. Proof, he says, not only of the absurdity of that definition of difference, but of the power of modern science to blow up false narratives about race and American history. Race, it seems, is a social concept, not a scientific fact. When I was growing up, we, like many other white Jewish families, had a housekeeper. Her name was Maddie, short for Madeline. Like the other housekeepers of Jewish families, Maddie was African-American. Maddie took great care in how she looked. She would change into clothes for cleaning our apartment, and then at the end of the day, change back for her trip home to Harlem. One day I caught sight of Maddie powdering her face in the mirror. The effect of the powder made her skin lighter. I was just a child, so I asked, Maddie, why do black people use power, powder to try to make their skin look lighter? Looking at me in the reflection of the mirror, Maddie asked gently, why do white people sit in the sun to make their skin look darker? So the first step in celebrating Black History Month might be trying to imagine what it is like to live in someone else's skin. And who knows, maybe some of us already have been. Shabbat Shalom.